Welcome to Mutual Exchange Radio, a project of the Center for Stateless Society. I'm your host, Zachary Woodman. Joining me today is Emmy Bevinzi. Emmy is a senior fellow at the Center for Stateless Society and is currently organizing the Mutual Exchange Symposium on Decentralization and Economic Coordination. They identify as a solar punk mutualist and research disinformation and fascism on the internet as a Mozilla Open Web Fellow and Data Scientist. In this discussion, we discuss Emmy's lead essay in C4S's recent mutual exchange on decentralization and economic coordination. This is a rich discussion about a complicated issue that anarchists of all stripes and political theorists more generally need to take on. How do we get goods delivered to where they need to be in society? Emmy expresses a sense of skepticism about claims social anarchists have made that communes can economically coordinate in the absence of markets. We also discussed the lead essay of and the reply to another essay from the exchange which tried to give a mathematical formulation of social anarchist attempts to work around a calculation problem by Aurora Apolito. This was an interesting and informative discussion and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed having it. So here's my conversation with Emmy. Hello and welcome to this episode of Mutual Exchange Radio. Joining me today is Emmy Bevinzi, a contributor to the to C4SS and uh, organizer of our latest Mutual Exchange on Economic Calculation and Anarchism. Hello, Emmy. Hi there. So today we're mostly going to talk about sort of, since this is Mutual Exchange Radio and we're doing a mutual exchange, it would make sense to talk about the Mutual Exchange on Mutual Exchange Radio. Um, So we're talking about sort of like what it's about, what your contributions to that discussion has been and uh, sort of some of the meat of what the discussion is. So I guess we're going to start with sort of very basics for any portion of our audience who is unfamiliar with it. What exactly is uh, the problem, the putative problem for various forms of socialism or socialist anarchism that we are trying to address here? So in order to supply for everyone's needs and make sure everyone's needs get met, there are complex problems to solve. And there are a lot of different proposals of how to solve these, but the issue is at baseline trying to meet demand and supply requirements. And whether you believe in some, you know, fully free market like liberal thing or some, you know, ANCOM thing or some peer to peer or whatever it is, uh, the problem still exists that it's complex. It's complex to meet everyone's needs. And so there's been a lot of debate about, so yeah, the next thing I'm guessing we're going to talk about is, you know, there was the calculation debate, which was predominantly between Austrian economists, neoclassicals, um, and socialists, and kind of post-Marxists and stuff. And so that was more from like a statist frame. Um, We can talk a little bit about what the central points of that were, but the question of this uh, mutual exchange is how do those debates apply or not apply to more decentralized forms of economic coordination? Right. So maybe we should start with what the historical debate was, uh, just to make sure we're all on even footing. So what was the calculation debate? Um, well, I'm, I think that actually you would probably have a better way of explaining the difference between like calculation and knowledge problems than me. But basically there was, there was different tensions, like whether the problem can be solved at all, whether like you can centrally plan an entire economy, whether it's even possible or whether it's desirable. Um, we're like two different variants of the calculation problem. And I guess ultimately a, a lot of this came down to debates between Hayek, Mises, and then ultimately the market socialists. Like Oscar Lange. Yeah. Right. So what were the various sides in this debate? Because the Hayek Mises view was not just that it was undesirable for independent, more liberal reasons, but that it was impossible was sort of the classic claim that Mises made in his uh, 1920 article, Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth. So like, what exactly does that claim amount to? Do you understand it? Well, there's been a lot of different variants of it, but basically that getting all of the required inputs and then turning that into an optimal allocation of goods and labor is intractable. Or even if it's tractable, it's de facto intractable by the means that we have available anytime in the near future. Right. 
So Mises's claim was that in the absence of prices or something like them, and something like private ownership of the means of production, then it would be fundamentally not possible to get the inputs to match the outputs that you would want for any given economy. And so, and then Hayek was like, prices act as these like stripped value signals that allow Mm -hmm. like more agile feedback loops to happen through market economics. And then the market socialists were kind of like, well, we can model these types of optimizations using like symbolic prices or something like this. Yeah, they were claiming that you could build this massive mathematical model that looked like a general equilibrium of the of sort of all the markets and economies and solve to get the market clearing prices everywhere. And use those as sort of exchange ratios between, you know, inputs and outputs and where goods should go. Yeah. And some of them believe that you need to have like ghost prices or you need to like mimic a market in some sense. Mm-hmm. And then some of them particularly the socialists like Cockshot and Cottrell, believe that you could centrally plan an entire economy without money, without any form of markets. Right. So that was sort of the historical background. The consensus immediately following the debate was that the socialists won in proving that it was technically, mathematically possible to do, but the Austrians were right in that it was practically impossible. And then along came certain modern Austrian economists like Don Lavoie, who argued that the problem was deeper than just a mathematical problem. It was also fundamentally epistemic. And there was absolutely no way to get over that epistemic problem to even get the math off the ground. He was challenged by like Kokoschak and Cottrell that it wasn't as hard as they were making it out. There was no like fundamental Cantor's diagonal pro- type problems. And you could just use, you know, linear programming and huge matrixes and and stuff. like that. Right. And to be clear, when I say the problem was epistemic uh, for someone like Lavoie and Hayek, I mean something more like uh, it's not possible to know what people's preferences are that you're trying to meet to begin with. And it's not possible to centralize a sort of localized tacit knowledge that producers need to be able to do their job to make things. Yeah. So I think that that's also like the... Hayekian emphasis is obviously on local knowledge. Mm-hmm. And the way to simplify an intractable problem is to move the locus of decision making closer and closer to an individual. Right. Uh, to simplify the problem as much as possible. Because humans are pretty good at dealing with uncertainty. Yeah. The idea is that, well, even though like you might not be able to tell some nameless, faceless bureaucrat in the Soviet, you know, what you want, how much bread you need to feed your kids or what have you you could tell someone closer to you or someone closer to you might have some more tractable ability to track what your wants and needs are. And so obviously this was predominantly between states. And this assumed states as the central yeah, unit. Either the one propping up the market mechanisms or uh, the one doing the planning. And so then you have weird stuff like Hayek being like, Pinochet is fine because... Political domination is fine as long as there's economic freedom. Mises had weird associations, and now there's the Ludwig yeah. von Mises Institute has gone like fully kind of alt right adjacent with Hoppe and other weird interpretations of it. Well, actually, with Pinochet, as I understand it, was a bit more complicated. He was almost like taking a real politique that so long as you have economic liberties, political liberties, and everything else we want will eventually follow. Yeah, and my argument is that is like a direct comp contradiction with a basic understanding of local knowledge. (laughs) Well, his endorsement of Pinochet in particular is right. I think that's right. Yeah, that was a complete contradiction of how he should view social change generally. Um, I think that was a huge mistake on his part to drastically understate things. It's also worth mentioning for the people who sort of don't know much about the inside baseball of Austrian economics, that there are various ways in which what LVMI does is not even accepted as like the Austrian view among economists, not just like the weird cultural alt-right stuff with people like Hapa, but like claiming that all of economics can be done completely a priori is a controversial reading of Mises to put it, to put it the least. Like Mises' own students disavow that like Israel Kirzner or their notion that like all banking should be on the gold standard is not what most Aust- practicing Austrian economists think. <laughs> I, but I think the point, and it starts to get into the question of decentralization, is that they were making a claim about what would ultimately be called like information theory. Right. And how information is passed 
And the reason that I wanted to make this mutual exchange is because I believe that those core tensions of information theory and coordinating economics apply to any economic proposal. Mm -hmm. They just apply in different ways to decentralized economics than to, you know, a central a five-year Soviet economic plan or whatever. Right. So the, the point here is that like on its face and income might say, well, we don't have a central planner, so we don't have to solve the economic calculation problem. But you're saying that, well, you still need some way to coordinate information in society. I mean, there's like some central ethical tension here. Like if you're uh, anti civ and you believe in massive depopulation of the earth and small subsistence economies or hunter gatherers, then you don't need to think about complexity and economic coordination because you've eliminated most humans. Essentially, that's just saying you don't need to do economic coordination because you just get rid of anything we would call, call an economy that needs coordinating. <laughs> yeah. So, so you get to have these like simple fake economies, like an economics textbook like the desert island economy. Whereas if you believe that it is a good thing for humans to try to create a sustainable and ethical economy that meets people's needs, then you basically have to face complexity problems and scale problems. And if we want to propose something that's in opposition to state control of economics, either like an authoritarian communist state or like, you know, some fundamentalist free market economy that's still statist. If you if you want to make a meaningful alternative to these, then you have to be able to prove that you're going to be able to navigate complexity. And so the argument that I made in my opening essay is that even if you have, my opening essay was called Social Anarchism and Economic Coordination. And so I was basically looking at the claim that communes um, I don't think, I haven't heard many ANCOMs make this claim, but I think that it's like the strongest version of the ANCOM claim that I could imagine. It's like the steel man of that position. And it's the position that I held when I was a social anarchist, which was that uh, communes just parallelize the problem. And so you can, like, it's totally possible. Like, obviously there was Iroquois longhouse systems where women were coordinating basic economic coordination within like a small village context where everyone knows each other and you have a general sense of everyone's needs and it's not too complicated. But whenever you get up beyond some certain Dunbar's number or something, and you start needing to coordinate to develop more complex goods, like something like a vaccine or something that requires um, materials from multiple places then the complexity problems start to come up again. To clarify more the position you're critiquing, the sort of steel man ancom view, is that really claiming that you got around the calculation problem? Because it seems to me like it's just saying, well, no, we have something that resembles highly, like larger family units or something like that. Um, or like you treat like these little, these communes as like, almost as like a firm in the like Kosian sense is like this black box where like there's planning going on within it. But then how are these communes like trading with each other outside of it? Like even in like indigenous economies, they had like elaborate trade systems throughout it. Why would that not just be like making the family larger, but having a market outside of it? <laughs> Yeah, I think the the conclusion that I came to is a bit based on historical examples. And also, I'm kind of advocating like this solar punk, futuristic mutualism or something that uses markets to coordinate everything that we can't plan. This is this is what I'm advocating is that thousands of years of indigenous existence have proven that you can locally coordinate um, lots of different revolutionary anarchist societies have proven, that even on smaller scales in modern anarchist movements, there's a lot that you can plan within a local mutual aid initiative. I'm just advocating that if we try to apply that logic to things that are outside of the complexity that we're actually able to plan for, then we will end up not being able to provide for people's needs. And at the point that we can't provide for people's needs, there would be a lot of negative externalities and those negative externalities would be people dying. 
or just like us not being able to respond. Can you give an example of something like that? Yeah. So Kevin Carson in his essay talks about let a hundred flowers bloom. And um, also in his like big study on transition to post-capitalism, he suggests that there's a lot that we can plan basically. And there's a lot that we can coordinate in these like kind of sprawling networks of coordination. So I think that anything that's like basic human survival, we should try to prioritize planning that to some as much as we can to ensure that because like markets leave people out, like there's a critique that markets are fundamentally ableist. Aside from the ANCOM critique that we can get into later, that markets fundamentally create accumulation, like create massive inequality, which is the whole kind of thing that C4SS kind of exists in opposition to. There's just the idea that markets don't really provide for people's needs, especially on the margins. And so I think that we can plan, we, we should just build very, very robust safety nets, basically. So that sounded different than what you said earlier, because if the idea is that you should build robust safety nets and those safety nets should be planned, like mutual aid societies, sort of like providing something like a basic income or something like that. That sounds right to me. But the thing you said earlier is that markets should exist in everything that we can't plan, but things like basic human needs like the first thing that came to my mind was like, well, what about agriculture or food or something like, like food production is probably something that can't be centrally planned because it requires this massive economy of inputs. Even even once you go outside of industrial agriculture, like there's still relative scarcities for the production of even basic foods that people need. I was thinking like, well, that sounds like something that's a basic need that you'd still need a market for. So can you sketch like? Yeah, well, I mean, in my mind, the way to deal with that has kind of already been shown in different contexts. Countries like Chile, for example, has universal health care, but then they also have a private health care system. And I'm definitely not advocating that Chile's health care system should be the model of modern ideal economies or whatever. But there is some meaningful sense in which the interaction of non-market spaces and market spaces can cultivate innovation and provide for the needs that aren't met by one space. So, so I don't know much about Chile's healthcare econ- economics, but the parts that are sent- that are universally provided are just like insurance and payment, whereas like hospitals are private. Is that the idea? As far as I know, just from my friends who are Chilean, um, it's that there are hospitals that anyone can go to for free, but that there are also like more advanced procedures that sometimes you have to pay for, or if there's something really urgent and you can't wait, then sometimes you can like use the parallel market economies. I think to some extent in the real, in in Chile, it exists as a way for the ultra wealthy to not have to interact with the sluggish and underfunded public systems. And so that's why I was saying it's not really what I advocate. And also, I don't know that that much about it. But nonetheless, I think that there's like some space for these sort of hybrid economies. So to move something like that to the stateless procedure, what it sounds like you have is you have a system of commonly funded like hospitals or something like that, that are free. It sounds to me like What's going on there is you've just introduced a new demander within a market context, but the new demander has sort of an independent funding stream. I want to say more? All the parts of medical care that cannot be sort of centrally planned are things like how many MRI machines are you going to build? How many tests, like swabs do you need to perform these tests, et cetera, et cetera. All that would still have to exist within a market space, but you just have a hospital that is funded by a mutual aid society or something like that, like, purchasing all those things for clientele to come and use it freely. Yeah. Like keep a basic stock of those things. Like I think that there, there are types of things that are, for example, planning for a pandemic is maybe not that economically profitable unless you can certainly predict that there's going to be a pandemic at some point in time. It's just going to be economic waste until a a pandemic comes. And so, you know, markets in the U.S. eventually responded and started making hand sanitizer and masks and respirators and things like that. But they certainly weren't planning for it. Whereas I think a community can pull resources. I mean, and this is what the Zapatistas actually do, because I was, I was, I went to the, I was in the Escuelitas and they had an insurance pool. That's what they called it. That was basically like a very decentralized form 
of tax, or maybe the article from Belinsky would call it. So this is just having non-profit maximizing entities who are existing within a broader market context, but are providing certain public goods. And I think that we can radically expand the spaces that those types of things cover. Mm-hmm. I just don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot by saying we should just abolish currency first. Yeah. Um, it's just not a thing that's happened in any kind of larger complex system. It sounds to me like very close to, well, I mean, it is a standard C4SS position, but I, I guess I'm confused as to why those non-market entities are being labeled as areas of analogous to communes, I guess. Because mm-hmm. it looks like they're just providing one or a couple small services as a public good to people who need them. Well, part of the issue for me in like responding to these deeper questions about what I'm proposing is that I don't actually want to be overly prescriptive with what I'm advocating because I acknowledge a large degree of uncertainty and like probable Mm -hmm. intended negative externalities with anything that I propose because I have limited knowledge. Part of owning up to the hierarchy and knowledge problem is being super prescriptive about how society would Uh itself. But nonetheless, when I engaged with the idea of a commune in my paper, it was more trying to look at whether communes in the ANCOM sense actually parallelize the problem. And what I found is that it's just confusing. To an extent, they do because they cultivate local knowledge a bit better. But there's a lot of different variants of what that could look like in how like an anarcho-syndicalist describes it versus an ANCOM, like, is there going to be a federated system of councils where you report all your needs? Or is it going to be some like high tech thing that just mostly when I talk to anarchists in the wild, and I talk to them about these issues, they advocate to me some high tech version of Kropotkin's free stores, where like, you can just go in, you take whatever you want, and then it all gets tracked in a big spreadsheet, and we use that to calculate what should be produced anywhere. Yeah, and that would run into calculation problem concerns very quickly. That would that runs into a ton of calculation problems really quickly. And I mean, there's an argument to be made that people wouldn't hoard because they know that society that their society like has their back or something like that. And that's what people mostly say to me. But that being said, it's so then you get into revealed preference. Even, um, if, you, even if you assume there's no incentive for people to take more than they need, the problem is how are the producers knowing what to put in the, on the store shelves to begin with? <laughs> right. That's how I think the argument is that, you know, we make a lot of councils and we do, a, we just make five year, like anarchist five versions of the five year plan. And that's it. That immediately gets you into calculation problem, though. I think that this would be a good time maybe to talk a little bit about Aurora's essay. Yeah, so let's pivot over to more sophisticated ANCOM handling of what the calculation problem, or of trying to make the calculation problem more tractable for a stateless society. So can you present to me, it's a bit... I think it's very difficult for the layperson to read Aurora's paper, but can you present sort of like in broad sketches what you think Aurora is arguing for? Yeah, and you can jump in on this too. And uh, there's maybe a possibility that we can get her in a little bit later to talk about it from her own perspective. As, as she said to me, this is a very early version of it in the sense that she wants to develop it a lot further. This is Aurora Polito, by the way. Just be- yeah. And her essay was called The Problem of Scale and Anarchism and a Case for Cybernetic Communism. Um, And so what she does is she runs through the history of sort of cybernetic communism, Mm -hmm. like Cybersyn and also just cybernetics in the Russian communist mathematician um, history of the Soviet Union. And it's like, it's a really fascinating read. It's really fun read. But Mm -hmm. then she gets into the parts that, as, as you say, I think are pretty hard for a lot of people to wrap their heads around, which is more technical math stuff. And the basics of the math, hopefully she won't be too mad at me for simplifying it in this way. Basically what she's saying is that the typical way that we look at complexity is through Kolmogorov complexity. And she's arguing, which is suffice to say, it's it's just how how complicated of a program 
we need to encode that data. Here, it would be like a program that you'd give to a classical computer. Yeah, so like when you zip a file to condense it, to compress it, it's it's sort of like that. I'm how, not many, gonna, how many instructions is does the computer need for it to... I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dwell on that too much. That's a standard like computational measure of complexity. Mm -hmm. And she's arguing that the way that we should optimize our economies is towards a more sophisticated measure of complexity. That basically she treats complexity as a goal in and of itself, and then tries to generate complex, decentralized, anarchist, communist economics through through those optimizations. And then she looks at different types of complexity. What here for one to treat? Complexity is a goal in and of itself of the system. So I think that she sees interconnection as increasing agency, which is something that I agree with deeply. And ironically, because she's her and Gillis are deeply opposed as thinkers, I think that they both agree on that same point as well. She sees complexity as like, in my mind, the scale of choices available to you meaningful choices available to you. Her view of markets is, I think, very limited by her exposure. She's an intergenerational leftist and an incredible mathematician, but I don't think she really understands the C4SS. Before we get to criticisms, let's, let's complete what her picture is. Your connections are who you could meaningfully connect with and what you could do together. And so the more of those types of connections we have, the more thriving the society is. And so she has this inter integrated complexity model that's kind of pulled from neurology and complexity science and a few different things. Can we say real quickly what like what that it is that we're trying to optimize here? We're trying to maximize the number sort of interconnectedness of individuals within a society while still maintaining their causal control over the whole system, right? Yeah, I would say that's that's my understanding. It's a bit confusing how her proposal actually solves coordination problems, but it's nonetheless, it's, it's like, to me, I think of her essay as, well, I have a response essay to her and some others that'll be coming out soon enough. And I describe her paper more as like a meta optimizer for societies in general than specifically something that solves meaningful economic coordination yeah. problems in a decentralized way. So it sort of says, look at all these different ways of building societies, which of these generates the most agency. And ironically, I'm not sure that it eliminates markets. <laughs> it so, would eliminate so it, she views that this is something that we can maximize, this notion of maximized interconnectedness with maximized control of each individual within the system. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess the next question is, well, practically, how is this at all a substitute for, uh, how does this help like us decide how much wheat we need to grow so that we can have enough bread to feed everyone? I mean, so, and maybe I'm misrepresenting her, but I think that her idea is that you could plug this in as the goal vector. You could use this somehow to create the ideal combination of products in a society. I do not think that she solves that problem. I think what she's doing is actually a different thing. To be fair to her, she does say that like you don't have instruments, I think is the word she uses to directly measure all that. And like more needs to be done to formalize that. Mm -hmm. But I guess the important question is, is it even possible to do that? <laughs> well, I mean, the biggest problem with her essay in my mind is just a similar problem I have with all my social anarchist friends and even people who wouldn't identify as social anarchists, but tend to just have a very understandable aversion to money and markets because they're horrifying in capitalism is sort of this faith that we could just figure it out without actually fully dealing with a number of problems. And the big problem that I think that she doesn't understand and a lot of similar thinkers don't understand is revealed preference and discovery, which is kind of like the Don LaVoy take on it. And I'm definitely not a radical liberal, like I don't worship markets, but nonetheless, so revealed preference, the way that I tend to describe revealed preference is the difference between all the books you say you're going to read versus the books you actually read. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like on your, your Netflix that you want to watch versus what you actually, you just binged, you know, mm -hmm. Avatar. I was going to watch this, you know, very cool, you know, French uh, documentary, French documentary, but I just binge watched 
uh, She-Ra or right. whatever. So, um, and so the way I describe it is skin in the game. And so markets handle revealed preference by saying, well, you have a set amount of money and the way that you show that you actually value this thing more than this thing is by spending more money on it. And what that does is it shows a more nuanced view of preferences. So in the like high tech Kropotkin free store, if someone takes the free vaccine and the free bubble wand, they take one of each of those things, then it's hard for us in calculating the ideal economy to understand that the vaccine is still more important than the bubble wand, even though the bubble wand is tight. And so I don't think that she handles discovery of a real preference at all. And in the same way that Kaksha and Control don't really deal with it in a way yeah. that I Yeah. So the idea is that people's desires and preferences are in a certain sense, completely unknowable, even to their sort of system one talking brain, like talking self. And so like the only way you can really measure that is to let people make decisions in the real world and markets do that. So the way I think I think Aurora is understanding it is that like markets are aimed at maximizing profit, whereas her model is aimed at maximizing this interconnectedness complexity uh, variable. But markets aren't just aimed at maximizing profit. That's just what the firms do. You also have consumers maximizing their utility, their preferences, right? It doesn't look to me like the sort of connectedness function is serving as a proxy for profit maximization in any important sense, the calculational role of profit maximization, which is just sort of this signal to the producers as to whether they are actually providing what people want. It's just like she's replacing Pareto efficiency with something more philosophically nuanced and interesting, if that makes sense. Yeah. The example that I got really hung up on when I was reading her essay was um, her talking about optimizing complexity in art. Yeah. And I don't want to misrepresent what she was writing because I know that she doesn't have some creepy dystopic vision in her head. So I don't know exactly what she meant by that. But to me reading it, I was just like, wait, you want some algorithm to decide what art is best and prioritize the creation of that art. And then like artists are supposed to what, like make the art that the complexity algorithm is most saying that they should make or what, like, you know, like I was just confused. about. I, yeah, I, I didn't view it as, so that section of the paper, it looks to me like she's arguing that this can be a proxy for whether the art market is producing different types of art that allow for like maximized choice or something like that in aesthetic preferences. It kind of looked like that while still giving the artists creativity, but it still looked like, okay, so then how on balance are the artists knowing what to make, right? (laughs) Or why should the artists even be told what to make? Right. Like it gets into weird territory too. Like Cockshot particularly does not value, like Cockshot is anti-sex worker, for example, because he doesn't view it as productive labor. And so it has these really weird implications for things like art and maybe like psychiatry, like psychology or something like that. I guess this gets sort of really far into the philosophical waters that I feel like we're skipped over here where it's like, okay, so you want to maximize this notion of, you know, interconnectedness as a measure of agency. But in order to for a planner to do that, the planner is going to be embedding in that certain value judgments that are controversial, like what sorts of arts should be produced or something like that. Whereas like if you if you stick to like the notion of Pareto efficiency, which is what markets are supposed to like realize in their textbook model form, that's at least something that like there aren't value judgments being made because people are being made as best off as they could be without making others worse off. Right? Mm-hmm. So it looked like, it yeah. looked to me like, you know, there was, there was this question skipped over as to whether you want an economic planner at any level making those sorts of judgments about what's valuable over other people. Thank you for listening to this episode of Mutual Exchange Radio. I just wanted to put a plug in for the center. If you are enjoying this conversation, you can read or listen to more about the theory and practice of market anarchism at c4ss.org. There are years worth of articles, books, and zines on current events, philosophy, politics, and the economics of the anarchist theory. There are books, essay collections, and swag available at the store.c4ss.org. You can check out as well.
If you are particularly interested in this conversation, you can find both uh, articles by Emmy and Aurora, as well as the rest of the Mutual Exchange, featuring pieces and responses on this topic from figures like Logan Glitterbaum, Frank Miroslav, and former guests of the show like Kevin Carson and Will Gillis. It's a really good conversation that covers far more than we could get to in this podcast, so check it out. This show and everything else the center does would not be possible without our donors and patrons. If you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash c4ss.org. That's patreon.com slash c4ss.org. I'll have more information on how you can support the show and the bonus goodies you get for doing so at the end. But for now, here's the rest of my conversation with Emmy. You know, there was there was this question skipped over as to whether you want an economic planner at any level making those sorts of judgments about what's valuable over other people. And, you know, is it truly better if that planner is an algorithm? I feel like most like left comms that I've talked to about this problem, what they actually want is like the Amazon recommendation algorithm running their entire society. I think and that's I'm uncharitable, like, but I get the point. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the the have you read that essay? There's this essay called "The Red Spot of Jupiter," which is the most I've seen any left com deal with Hyatt. And I kind of feel like they're just hand waving that machine learning solves these problems. Right. And you have uh, a note in your piece about how machine learning actually makes it more mathematically complicated. <laughs> yeah, depending on how you're depending on how you're going to deal with it. But I just I don't want a planner deciding my preferences for me, and I also don't want an algorithm deciding my preferences for me right and so i'm not and i'm not saying that markets do this you know perfectly like there are all kinds of weird issues in markets even the idea that price perfectly represents preference is confusing when you think of like well a dollar means a very different thing to someone who's poor or someone who's rich you know like luxury goods are the super bizarre thing in terms of the degree to which they represent preference in my mind well, I mean, so, dollars don't represent preferences. Another issue here is that preferences, as we understand them in like utility theory, are fundamentally incommensurable between individuals. Like there's no mm-hmm. common unit in which we can say you like, you know, listening to this podcast as much as I do. Yeah. Like there's no common util measuring our two things. What money enables us is it enables us to like relatively, it doesn't directly measure our preferences, but it engages us to relatively trade between each other, given that our preferences are incommensurable. Yeah. I think that's one key reason why, even if you want to get rid of a lot of market mechanisms in society, you're never going to abolish money or something like it. Because you need some way for people to sort of like interact with each other through goods without like resorting to some to either someone else's judgment, like a dictator, or uh, just one person dominating the other. There's an essay coming, having read all the essays and edited them all. There's an essay coming that responds to my lead essay and basically says that I don't deal enough or I don't give deliberation enough credit. I overly critique deliberation. It says a bunch more than that. You can read it when it comes out. Okay. But it says I... I overly discredit deliberation uh, because I I argue a lot about the inefficiencies of communicating preferences. Mm -hmm. And I do actually agree with this idea that the way that a market models preferences is different than the way that when you're in an intimate relationship, you and your partner have contradictory needs about something and you're trying to make a decision. It's pretty hard to explain to each other how strongly you feel or you want this thing, especially if you're trying to like model how strongly they want the thing. You're like, do I want it more? You know, okay, we both need the car and you really want this food. And I really want to solve this other thing. Like talking about how important it is, is complicated, but we can kind of explain really high complexity information to each other about our preferences. So there's something to be said for communication. It solves different types of problems than the sort of stripped down value signal of spot transaction. Yeah, I guess that's a view. I'm skeptical. I'll have to read that piece when it comes out. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm skeptical for a lot of reasons, but we don't have to go into those now. That's my read on their critique. That's not necessarily their critique of me. Let's uh, let's go back to Aurora's piece and let's talk about why exactly are AMCOMs so skeptical of markets to begin with. 
if the calculation problem is unsolvable, why don't they just go, okay, I guess we'll have some sort of market going on here or there. I think that there's something actually very audacious and very deeply anarchist about being like, abolish money. I think that's wrong. I don't think that we should say that, but I think that it has that really beautiful, like audacious spirit to it. And where I think that comes from is the, is like, to the extent that most, in, in my opinion, I'm pretty biased against ANCAPs from being on the internet, but I would say most ANCAPs are incapable of meaningfully imagining domination by a firm as being sort of similar to domination by a state. And so tend to apologize for corporate corporations, like in the way that Jeffrey Tucker just loves Walmart and McDonald's so much. Yeah. And I understand his argument. He's like, you know, cheap food, tons of jobs all around the world or whatever. But a corporation can buy an army. They often do. And, you know, they become like proto states in a similar way to a strong enough mafia becomes uh, a form of cartel that that is like a semi-state. Mm-hmm. Thing. So to the extent that a lot of ANCAPs, I think, are incapable of imagining domination through capital accumulation, I think that a lot of ANCOMs are incapable or like ha- really struggle to imagine social personal capital. domination. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the, the types of like, so if you do, this is, and someone will say this is a straw man and I apologize, but I have to address this straw man. So like if there's a series of councils and you have to appeal to your need, your needs to those councils, then the person who's going to get their needs met is the extremely popular comrade. The one who's very good at leveraging the social cues of that community and makes lots of friends, probably is physically attractive. You know, like the other comrade who's make, who's on the council, like really wants to sleep with them. So they're, you know, even if they really believe well in their heart, they're slightly more like- This is actually how like the internal politics of Soviet, of the Soviet Union operated. Well, this is also how the internal politics of how a lot of left anarchist spaces work. This is like an open secret that anybody who's actually organizes understands exists, but it's complicated to address because, well, it's just, it's just delicate. Um, And so- I think that abolishing money, the the audacity of it is to say that we will abolish hierarchy and we will be able to just coordinate in a pure, this is actually, so we, we had one sort of uh, peer-to-peer game B type person. And I think that a lot of people in that community do a similar type of wish magical thinking where they recognize that zero sum interactions produce like sadness <laughs> produce right. loss and suffering and so try to imagine a world that is only cooperative games basically and tries to maximize the space of non-zero sum interaction which i vibe with i vibe with like and it sounds really good and it feels really good to think and it just is hard because the world is scarce like labor is scarce yeah. Resources are scarce. I like post scarcity can can be meaningful t- to the extent that we're you know to a relative extent, but scarcity is a fundamental aspect of reality. Mm-hmm. Here we're talking about the economic concept of scarcity, which is much broader than just is there enough food to feed people, right? Even if we all are super altruistic beings, mm-hmm. you know, like perfect comrades there's still going to be a situation where two people or two, you know, villages or something want something. And there's not enough of that, that, you know, that is a rivalrous good. And we have to decide how to move it. And so I think that there's a lot of hand waving that can be done about things like that, that make it seem like if we're nice to each other, it'll work out. But that In reality, it's just a really, really hard problem space. And that's why I don't like worship markets, but I'm kind of like, they're they're, They certainly expand the space of information transfer. And 
the more information that we can move through our networks, the greater, in Aurora's sense, the greater complexity that we can create in a society. Mm -hmm. And so I just don't want to like eliminate spaces. I want to like recognize the potential for negative externalities and things like markets and organize against accumulation in one realm, like capital, but I also want to organize against gross accumulation in another realm, like social capital. Yeah. So Aurora does have in that paper have this line where uh, they say markets inherently generate some level of wealth inequality. And that seems to be the reason why, you know, they think that we can't have markets are off the table. It's almost like in like distributive justice philosophy, one of the least popular views is absolute material equality as like the distributive outcome that's to be preferred. Well, because nobody wants all the same things. Yeah, nobody wants all the same things. Nobody needs all the same things. It seems like it's not just that markets upset that, it's that any little bit of interaction that we would want people to be able to do would upset that. Just take Nozick's Fult Chamberlain example and modify it so that it's about choosing to paint instead of farm. <laughs> yeah. Kevin addresses this idea kind of interestingly in his essay where he's just like, obviously C4SS has this whole history of looking at counter countervailing mechanisms against mass accumulation through markets. But aside from that, Kevin has this interesting take in his essay where he's kind of like, we have a very limited view of what exchange through mediums of exchange, such as currency, could look like because all we know is capitalism. Right. And its particular types of property titles, for example. Right. But even, even just on the topic of property titles, like, is this huge space, both theoretically of what is possible, but also practically of what has happened. And capitalism, as we know it, is just like this very thin line through that space. And so exploring that space with certain ethics of trying to prevent coercion is, I think, like a meaningful path. I agree. And that's just sort of like ignored in that perspective. But I think like my bigger problem with it was that it takes this very unpopular view for good reason of distributive justice and just treats that as, well, markets can't do that. So therefore they're bad. <laughs> I think that she's addressing ratchet accumulation. She's she's working from the assumption that if you have any medium of exchange, you'll have runaway accumulation. Yeah, and that so, it, so if that's the claim, if that's the empirical claim that, okay, well, the minute you introduce markets, you're immediately going to wind up with, you know, Walmart and Jeff Bezos. That's different than the claim she makes, which is that introducing profit a profit mechanism immediately leads to inequitable outcomes. That's right. But it's not obvious to me why that's a problem. If the claim is instead that, well, it immediately leads to Jeff Bezos or something like it, a level of inequality such that it undermines the ability of individuals to compete on equal terms, something like that, then that looks like a far more controversial empirical hypothesis that we don't know enough to say to begin with. And, C yeah. and C4SS has a long history of claiming of claiming sometimes too strongly, even for my taste, that it won't. But, um, yeah, Kevin Carson says that we're going to reduce profit to zero. Yeah, which I think it's, I think it's right that it's not, I think it's right that there's good reason to be optimistic about that from a market perspective uh, in the way that a lot of actually existing inequalities are a result of things people like Kevin critique, like intellectual property and artificially high economies of scale and all that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it doesn't address obviously like the Benjamin Tucker and the many monopolies. Yeah. And the yeah. Way it's prop up like artificial economies of scale or whatever. Or the way in which like even theoretically you could have the people who are winning the market game of the day by accumulating the most profits being radically different today than it is just five days from now. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, what you need is not just to show that one person is one person is accumulating wealth at one moment. It's that they have a mechanism to continue to accumulate wealth in perpetuity to the point that it becomes a problem. And with states, you have, you know, rent seeking is that mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's not obvious that you have a mechanism like that outside of that context in every industry and in every firm everywhere, at the very least. Yeah. I guess my interest is in things that coordinate 
getting people's needs met with the least negative externalities. And the way that we handle that is sort of by amplifying countervailing forces against types of accumulation that lend themselves to coercive rent-seeking or extractivism. Like the fact that a lot of ANCAPs that you talk to on the internet will like quickly justify what they call voluntary slavery as like someone is in the desert and I've had this argument. So I have the example in my head where they're like, you know, someone's in the desert and you have water and uh, you offer them to be your slave in exchange for water or whatever, you know, that should, that should be allowed to exist because it fills a market niche of people lost in the desert or whatever. That's kind of a, that's kind of a straw man, but nonetheless, that's like kind of, that's the argument. But to me, like the anarchist ethics are like- You have an oh, obligation to give the person water in some sense. Yeah, right. why can't you give them water? What the fuck? <laughs> well, I mean, that's not just the anarchist view. I think that's the reaction most people have to that case. You can build that sort of thing into theories of just claims and property rights by like reading the locking proviso a certain way, as leave as much in enough for others as is possible when you accumulate. or. Uh, you know, I just wrote a whole paper explaining Thomas Reed's view of property that is designed to handle that sort of thing. But I think it's right to be skeptical about that, about a society where that sort of thing is allowed to happen. But it seems to me like, you know, the alternative of hand-waving away a lot of hard problems that you need just to meet anyone's basic needs to begin with is something that needs to be fessed up to more more commonly among the market skeptics. I think that one of the cool things about this mutual exchange is even the people who like hated my essay, um, I acknowledged in their arguments against me that scale is hard and coordination is hard which is actually more than I've gotten in the past. Yeah, and I think that's a good like, step in this itself, exchange. Yeah, like, like it's a huge, huge accomplishment. But like generally the calculation problem is somewhat different than just a problem of scale. Yeah, although they're related. Yeah, they're related because the calculation problem emerges at a problem of scale, at a certain yeah. scale. But it's not just like, how do you take what's happening in the family and scale it up? Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's yeah. also like, how did, would different communes interact with each other to begin with, without something like trade? Yeah. I mean, the way that I think about this problem fundamentally, it maybe has to do with the fact that I'm like a data scientist, and like a computer scientist, is, I mean, I sort of adopt the Hayekian view of like, mm-hmm. Hayek plus Kevin Carson, of that you can only hold so much information in your head at once, and even a computer can only hold so much information in its RAM at once. So the more computers or people we can have simultaneously solving small parts of the problem, then the simpler that larger coordination problem is. And so to me, that information throttling problem applies to both markets as they're traditionally construed with currencies, but it also applies to like interpersonal hierarchies. Right. And the more that you're entrusting a bureaucracy of coordination where at each level of the bureau, this was kind of like um, one of the essays that was about institutional limits in a complex world is like at each level of the bureaucracy of a corporation or a state or an ANCOM federation, you have to simplify the stories that are being told locally in order to pass it through that person's head, you know, whether it's a manager or a uh, federated committee. As a result of that, whoever's the the higher level of the committee, even if those committees are relatively decentralized in some sort of anarchist way, are still going to have a very limited view of what's happening at the local levels. They're going to have sort of a James C. Scott simplified map of what's happening. And so they're they're not going to be in a good position to make decisions for those local actors. To me, anarchism itself is a way of maximizing local knowledge, but not just strictly in the Austrian capitalist way, but in like all aspects of our world. And so that's where I kind of agree with what she's saying, of like maximizing agency at the local level and coordinating interconnectedness. I just don't necessarily... Yeah, it feels to me like there's a really interesting 
mathematical formalization of a moral intuition there, but I'm not <laughs> sure it helps with the problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So one other aspect of the problem that I haven't seen pop up in the debate much, Will's piece might have had a bit about this, but is how does how does your model handle change that happens unforeseen very quickly, you know, within a society? Because you can have like your five year plan so that you've mm -hmm. like even if you imagine that you have a supercomputer that managed to solve the general equilibrium model at t equals zero, mm -hmm. what happens when you know, a year from now, a natural disaster made it so that you can no longer produce steel because a massive steel plant got burned down. And in capitalism, you know, you have this mechanism that immediately results in the price of steel going up. So now it's more, it's a signal of its relative scarcity. So now, you know, people use less steel, at least theoretically, that's how the market should function. Maybe not in capitalism, I should say, but... Um, <laughs> Whereas it's not obvious that you have a system that can dynamically respond to that in the absence of a market. So how do you see ANCOMS hand, could handle that horn of the problem? Um, well, I definitely am inspired a lot by Kevin Carson's, you know, work on very agile feedback loops, like in desktop regulatory state, he talks about it a lot. Yeah, he, he talked about it in that book in the sense of like the U.S. military was very bad at responding to IEDs, whereas those technologies uh, proliferated very quickly amongst combatants because they were more decentralized organizations and they had quicker feedback loops, whereas they didn't have to send it up like a very rigid hierarchy and get it, you know, changes approved. Oh, we need to put, you know, steel plates on the bottom of our vehicles. Uh, that's going to require talking to a thousand people, <laughs> um, as opposed to, I just posted this thing on the internet. Um, so agile feedback loops, I think, are the critical point in responding to any type of sudden change. And I think that capitalism fails in a similar way to like centralized socialist economic planning because it disrupts those agile feedback loops through central planning mechanisms and- uh, Give an example of what you mean. So I'll, I'll, I'll look at it in a decentralized like ANCOM way. I believe that ANCOM societies can respond to disasters to some, you know, to some large degree and coordinate like every, every, like, I definitely am very excited about sort of, um, you know, like Scott Crow advocates parallel emergency infrastructure. And there's a lot of examples of like in an emergency, people banding together and doing really, really incredible mutual aid organizing. So I do believe there's an extent to which people can respond very rapidly to changes in circumstances and kind of find priorities. I mean, can you give an in, example yeah. of where how capitalism sort of creates central planning things that interrupt uh, agile feedback loops? Well, I mean, I think the corporation, like large subsidized firms, uh, as Kevin Carson has written about extensively, the your average worker is disincentivized from presenting accurate information to management. <laughs> And that has a systematic impact on the way that the firm organizes internally. Okay. Um, but people at the bottom of the hierarchy are like the victims of capitalism know the most about how it's failing and are the least able to push feedback back into the capitalist system because there's like, because there's such accumulation, the value signals of Raytheon are a lot louder in some sense than the value signals of someone who's like living off food. Okay, so it sounds like what you're saying is that things like when I was talking about dynamic change, I was just simply talking about like demand and supply shocks, not necessarily disaster scenarios, although disasters can cause demand and supply shocks. So not unrelated, but it sounds like what you're saying is that within capitalism, it's not just like markets. It also involves the provision of certain public goods through the state, like disaster relief stuff. And the only feedback loops that that would have is the people who happened to have attained the most financial influence over the state as a result of the rigged market game. Yeah. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I guess maybe getting more at what you're, I, I think you're trying to ask me. In my opinion, people are able to respond to 
a change in circumstance in some sort of agile way as proven by mutual aid in the wake of disasters. That's just my like sort of case for ANCOM styles of organizing in some sense. But I think that that is very limited in the way that it can respond to changes. Like it'll, it'll be really hard to explain to every level of the Federation you're experiencing drought in your area like rapidly enough to like pivot the economic plan or something. Well, it's not just the drought. It's all the unforeseen effects of that drought. It's that now thanks to the drought, obviously we can't grow wheat, but now thanks to you can't grow wheat, uh, there isn't enough flour on the market, which means there's enough bread on the market, which means people are buying more rye bread or rice instead of bread, which means, you know, it's that whole interconnected jumble of what happens when there's a shock to one tiny bit of the system, right? And so if you have to communicate all of that in words, it's going to take a long time. And so Uh, I think that. And I also don't think that you're ever going to be able to know what all those knock on effects are. Well, certainly not. Like I was talking with some people the other day about how, like, to my knowledge, like Marxist dialectical materialism hasn't really adequately dealt with modern complex supply chains uh, in the way that like a complex systems theory does analysis does and i think that that's a similar problem here which is that these are complex systems and the whole point of complex systems is that they're extremely hard to model much less for an individual's mind so i have a limit of how much i can know about the second and third order impacts of this drought Um, and so coordinating those dispersed types of information is in my mind the task of like a bunch of different types of interventions and i think that the ancom system is artificially strict in a way that limits their ability to create like agile feedback loops okay but that it's but that it solves one it helps with one part of the problem but not all parts of the problem Sounds to me like parts that helps with are just the parts, like your example was mutual aid. It's just the parts that are sort of classic textbook market failures to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, now that, now that the grain field burned, this person also doesn't have a livelihood. Yeah. And so our community needs to look out for this person. Okay. So you can give that person a livelihood, but now all the people who depended on his grain also need some substitute like rice. So the rice patty halfway across the world needs to know to ramp up its production. Yeah. And how do we, how and do we, that's the part that. that's not being addressed. And, and maybe they're really nice people, but they don't actually need to know about every single yeah. struggle related to that wheat thing because they actually can't process that much information. Right. Right. And like, I guess it seems to me like the agile feedback loop stuff is sort of a layer on top of any attempt to solve the calculation problem or the knowledge problem as well. I think that when people get caught up in the modeling, like a static general equilibrium model, they don't appreciate that it needs to be responsive at every single instant. Well, it's actually a disequilibrium model, right? Because it is has to be able to respond to yeah yeah yeah. your equilibrium model needs to be able to handle disequilibrium is the more technical way of putting it right yeah all right um was there anything else um no i i would like to make a pitch that if anybody uh you know has thoughts on this our exchange here or on the lead essays uh we're still accepting responses so Go ahead and um, get in touch with uh, editor at c4ss.org if you'd like to submit a response. And uh, there's a question that I have that I end every single episode with. That I, mm-hmm. What are three, uh, besides the mutual exchange itself, what are three books, essays, uh, interpretive dances, movies, whatever, that you think uh, the audience should read to learn more about this topic? Um, so one of the uh, one of the background readings for this mutual exchange was this essay called uh, "In Soviet In Soviet Union Optimization Problem Solves You" 
by Crooked Timber. And it's not like an anarchist essay, but I think that it, for me, I, from a decentralization perspective, I, I like, I was really interested in the problems that it poses from like a more computational perspective to this, uh, to these issues. You know, Kevin Carson's desktop regulatory state, I mentioned it in our talk, like has some really interesting uh, views on this. But even beyond like books uh, and essays and stuff, um, I guess I would encourage people to make experiments and in in these worlds like you know for me like what is what would a savings pool look like between you and your friends where you use that you use that to help each other get out of the grips of predatory lenders and things like that so little little experience little experiments in mutual exchange and mutual aid that um that exist in the actual world that we live in that are maybe a little bit more sophisticated and a little more high trust than, you know, putting a free box of, uh, of old clothes at your local in info shop. So yeah, maybe trying to build like higher trust experiments with people that you, you have repeated interaction with would be my, my third one. All right. Emmy, thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great to talk. Thank you for listening to this episode of Mutual Exchange Radio. I'd like to thank Emmy again for coming on to discuss this fascinating topic. As I mentioned earlier, if you like this show and want to support what we do, you can support us on Patreon. If you decide to do so, you will get special bonus content and swag as a thank you, including free books, buttons, zines, and special credit at the end of the show, and bonus interviews and episodes. If any of that sounds appealing to you, or if you just want to support these types of projects and conversations, you can go to patreon.com slash c4ss.org. That's patreon.com slash c4ss.org. And a special thank you to our current associate producers on Patreon, Stacey Jamal, Derek W., David Colburn, Ackner Alls, Humanosphere, Lindsay Robert, Curtis Ekman, Jacob Seikman, E.T., Alex Kukowski, and James Tuttle. Thank you again for listening to this episode of Mutual Exchange Radio, and I hope to see you in the next one.